want to thank God for all of you. We are going to start a new series today. And uh, because I have done with one part of the John's Gospel, I would like to move on, stop there and move on, and may come back later. But can we have the scripture portion which we'll read in we'll read responsively Psalm 73 verses 1 onwards till the end of it I will read the first verse and alternate verses will be displayed or both verses will be displayed so you can join me in reading the second verse I read alternate verses and you read alternate verses I read, uh, I read the odd verses and you read the even verses. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, the, then I discerned their end. <clears throat> How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by ter terrors. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Sorry. Can I read 23? Nevertheless, I was continually with you. You hold my right hand. Whom have I in heaven but you? But there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. Amen. Now the mood of the modern age has shifted to, to an obsession with happiness. If you go to TED Talks or to YouTube or to Google and just type happiness, search for happiness, you will come across a wide spectrum of speakers, motivation speakers, corporate trainers and a whole lot of things, behavioral scientists, all talking about one thing, happiness. There are many longitudinal studies that are going on to find out what makes people happy because happiness is one of the things that is most sought after by the modern world somebody made a study she sent out survey forms and told people that i am traveling from different i'm going to different holy places 
Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, and all sorts of places. And what would you like to pray, me to pray for you in these places? What would you like me to pray for you when I visit all these places? And she'd send a list of things and ask people. And people ask for many things. They said specific things. But after when the whole thing was summed up, there were three things that everybody wanted. Everybody wanted three things. One is wealth. Second is health. And the third is happiness. Though I said it is the third thing, that was the priority that everybody had. But none of them did wanted just health. They wanted wealth and health plus happiness. Because they tied happiness to these two other things. That is health and wealth. What makes a person happy? How can you be happy? You can be happy only when you have enough wealth and when you have sufficient health to enjoy that wealth, then only you can be happy. They are all tied together. That is how the world looks at the whole issue. There is nobody who wants to be sad, suffering. There is nobody who wants to be poor. Nobody wants to be sick. Who will choose sickness? Who will choose poverty? Who will choose an unhappiness or sorrow, sadness, grief? Nobody wants it. But the way the people look at our world, the generation that we live, our friends out there and even sometimes most of us here, think that these three things are tied as well. The topmost thing is happiness. For to be happy, you have to be wealthy and you have to be healthy. Now, if you read the Bible, Bible also puts a lot of emphasis on being happy. Don't ever think that Bible teaches you to be sad, grieving, and sorrowful. The Bible, if you take the oral message of the Bible, it is to make people blessed, happy, prosper, and that is the message of the Bible. It is not just to be very ascetic and detached from or uh, very platonic. That is not what this thing is. Happiness is the major thing. You may know this Bible verse. I have we can quote uh, so many Bible verses. But you may know this Bible verse, Philippians 4.4. 4. What does it say? Many of you might have memorized it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. Rejoicing. Happiness is what God wants us to be. But, then what is the difference between a Christian, Bible-believing, Jesus-believing, Christian and the world, they want happiness, you also want happiness. But there is a uniqueness there. Because Bible teaches, Jesus teaches us a unique way of being happy. When the world wants to be happy, and they think for the happiness, wealth is important, essential, without that you cannot be happy. Health is important, without being health, you cannot be happy. The Bible teaches a unique way of being happy, that is, we can be happy even when we are not healthy and even when we are not wealthy. And which one will you choose? The way our generation looks at it, that is to be healthy and wealthy and be happy. Or the Jesus way, the Bible way, that happy even when you are not healthy and wealthy. I would choose the second, Jesus way, for I will have reasons. Because, first of all, my first reason is, I want to be happy always. Like the rest of the world, happiness is the top priority. Happiness is the top priority. I want to be happy. But one thing I also know, that I always will not be healthy. I will not always have the wealth that I want to have. These are variables. So I, because wealth and health are not permanent, they may go away, they may be less or more, the best and the wisest way is to remain happy and untether wealth and health or detach 
the wealth and health as conditions for happiness. That's the best way to be happy, isn't it? Let me say it again if I didn't get it across to you. The best way to be happy is not being healthy and wealthy and as a result, happy. It is Jesus, the way Jesus or the Bible teaches, even if you are not healthy, even if you are not wealthy, still remain happy. Because wealth and health are not reliable. They will come and they will go. So if your happiness goes away when your wealth decreases, when your health decreases, that sort of a happiness is unreliable and useless. So remain in a constant, irrespective of the variables of health and wealth. That's a quite a long introduction for a psalm. Now the whole theme of this psalm is about that. How to remain happy? How to remain happy? Even if there is not enough wealth, even if there is not enough health. Before I zero down on this theme, I just want to walk with you through the psalm. So you should have, or it will be on the screen, hope Rubina has taken over. You know, the psalm begins with an affirmation. The affirmation or a confession, a statement, that the psalmist, he is a teacher of wisdom. He says, he, he declares that and he says in verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are Poor in heart, pure in heart. Truly God <coughs> is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That is the statement. Then he moves on to the reality. I know this truth, but I also realize that doesn't really work. So he says, he goes on to Psalm 73, 2 to 3 and talks about his condition, his predicament, his questions. You know, he says, 73, 2 to 3, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Have you ever been in that sort of situation? Those who had to walk on, in snow or on ice know that. When you put your feet, it, it goes this way or that way. Cars skid, vehicles skid. Your sleep, your steps slip. Why? What is the, what, what's the problem? It's talking about, when you talk about sleep, it is talking about the doubts that I have. I know this. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. This is what I know. Now, when my son was five or six years, we taught him something, a truth. That is, toffees, sweets are not good for your teeth. We told him. He's, and we repeatedly asked, told him, and he memorized that truth. He said, uh, toffee or sweets are not good for my teeth. Son, say that. He will say, toffee. And then if he just give a cue, he will say, toffee is not good for my teeth. Then the next question we ask him is, you want a toffee now? He said, yes. <laughs> the thing is, we know the truth. But our feet slip. This is what the psalmist was going through. Goodness of God, he is good to Israel and he is good to those who are pure in heart, but I am not very sure about it because the experience. I am bitter. My feet is almost, I have doubt. Now the whole sort of the thinking, this theory about God doesn't really work in my life. It, I have questions about it. And he says in verse 22, now thinking about this, meditating and rolling it in my head again and again and again and again, I had a problem. I was brutish and ignorant, 73 verse 22. I was a beast like towards you. He says, God, now thinking about this, what is the thinking that he has? Is God really good? Because he see the experience is contrary to the faith that he has. I'll come to that in a minute. So he said, he is sort of, sort of, estranged, estranged from God. 
The reason he says in verse 2, simply because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Ah, that's the problem. The wicked, people who have no concern for God, they are prospering. People are getting wealthy and healthy without God and they are very happy. That's what I see now. So because of this wicked, I am envious of them. And that envy causes sadness, a sense of loss, a sense of worthlessness. And that makes me b behave like an animal to God. Now, animals have no respect for God, no, no sense of God. Have you ever been through that sort of a situation? That you are the first or the only believer in your family. And rest of your family members or the wider family or the society, they, are, they don't believe in God. They have a lot of free time, for especially. They don't have to come for Bible studies and prayer. And Sunday morning, two hours, there, you don't have to waste that. You can go shopping, you can do all sorts of things. When Amazon releases a new phone, you can be there most of the time. They release it between 10.30 and 12 on Sunday mornings. I don't know why. Probably they don't want Christians to buy it. So, we are losers, isn't it? Without these sort of things, they are having happiness, they are wealthy, they are, help, uh, they are happy, they are um, uh, wealthy and healthy. So, what's the use of being after God? Many of us go through that sort of question. That is Sami's problem too. Then he goes on to describe in seven, verses 73, 4 to 12, he goes on to describe the wicked. <laughs> you know, his own perspective. He looks at the wicked from his own view, uh, viewpoint and he says, and if you read that, I don't want to spend all, all, my, all lot of my time there. Sami says, you know, they are healthy, they have no pains, they have no, they have enough, and moreover, they behave with others violently, and they blasphemous. They are they talk bad things about God. Does God know? That's what they ask. They don't need God in their life. They come to a stage where, if you summarize the whole of that eight verses, seventy-three, four to twelve, what the psalmist is saying: these people can do better than me in life without God. They are doing better than me without God. And in 73, 15, 13 to 15, the next section, he says, look at me, self-pity. I have plagues in my life, my flesh is weak, I am not wealthy, and I am bitter. I am not very happy. 73, 13 to 15, he says, for all in vain have I kept my heart clean and wash my hands in innocence. I refused to pay a bribe and I lost that property. I refused to uh, just tweak my CV because, because of my integrity, my, the, what I know about God, righteousness before God, I lost the job. I refused to say no to my boss, so I was terminated and rebuked every morning. That's what is happening to me. So what's the point of following God? But in verses 16 to 17, the psalmist comes to a turning point. The whole thing turns around. And then in verses 18 to 22, he gets a new perspective, new insight. He gets two insights. What are the two insights? He gets a view, a proper view of what the wicked is. Look at that. And he says, truly, when he had a new perspective, the new perspective is a perspective, a view of the righteous people, godly people, and the wicked people. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How are destroyed in a moment, swept away in, in, by terrorists? They are 
transient, they pass away. I don't need to give you a commentary. If you have watched what's happening in the corporate world in India now, look at Vijay Malia. And I used to fly, I was a frequent flyer in Kingfisher Airlines. Have you heard about that? Yeah, the king of good times, something like that. And uh, when I, I used to shuttle between Delhi and uh, Pune uh, some years back, very frequently, most of every month sort of thing. Morning I fly out and evening I come back. And uh, for a few days I had to do that. And every time I flew by King Fisher. But now it's part of history. Vijay Malia is now in a sort of self-imposed exile. And he will be brought to India and he will have a place in Arthur Jail in Mumbai. I'm not saying Vijay Malia is wicked. We have a half a dozen examples in between 2017 and today. At least half a dozen examples of the wealthiest people, the healthiest people, once happy people, now lost everything and very unhappy. And the world looks at them with disdain. That is the commentary of this. But the righteous people, the Samis also got a new perspective. And, and they, in verse 23 to 26, they have found a new security. They have found a new security, something to hang on to. Something to hang on to when everything is lost. Growing up in a rural area, I used to spend most of my, not most of my, uh, a considerable part of my holidays in water because we had a lake behind my house, I mean, which was part of my, our, my, my father's property as well. So I spent most of the time there. But sometimes, you know, the, the sand under your feet will just slip. Sometimes there will be current. Sometimes you go out of depth. And desperately, you need something to hang on. Most of the time, we, we used to hang on to the little canoe that we had. No, myself and my brothers will we'll go in this, we'll, we'll row into the lake and then jump out of it and find that the water is too deep for us. We are out of depth with the water. What to do? Just hang on to the canoe, hanging on. That gives security. And we move it a little bit, uh, slide it towards the shore or where we can stand on. Here, the Sami says, yeah, with all this turbulence in my life, with all the doubts that is impacting my brain, my thinking, I have found a security. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. He tells God. He speaks to God. You are holding my right hand. What an amazing thought. And he says not only that, in the present moment, right now, my hand is held by you, like a little child hangs on to the hand or the strong hand of an elderly person. And I know that afterward you will receive me to glory, whom I have in heaven but you, nobody else. And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Sami says, now, I have found something new that others don't have. As I said, health is not permanent. Wealth is not permanent. Any happiness that is tied to health and wealth are also not real because both these things will go. So then where is security? Sami says, I found the security. I found the security to be happy in God, because these are like just passing. You know, one of the best things, I think the church has to go for a picnic um, to the nature, to see the nature. You are not seeing the nature. We only see the ceramic floors and concrete pavements. We are, the, the world is much bigger than this, the reality. We don't know the texture of the soil or, no, we don't, we don't, because we are 
living in an artificial world. You know, the point is, have you ever watched the valley from a mountain top or a hilltop? That's a beautiful view. You know what happens? You sit on the top of this little hill, maybe on Launawala Hill, and see the valley on a sunny day and partially cloudy day. You can see the cloud over your head and you have darkness, you are in darkness, a sort of darkness. And then the wind blows the cloud away, then you are in the sun, bright sun. And then again, the cloud moves on to your friends who are sitting on the other peak, or the other side of the mount, uh, hill. And they are in dark, you are in bright. Life is like that, brothers and sisters. It's not always being healthy. It is not always being wealthy. It comes and goes. But in spite of that, the hills and the valleys, in spite of darkness and brightness, instead of, in spite of cloudy days and sunny days, to remain happy throughout is the gift of God. That is the gift of God. And some is come, now comes, re, he says, rephrases all that he said. He makes a new confession. He reformulates his faith. He says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your wonderful works. He made two discoveries. That is, what is misery? What is being miserable in life? He says in verse 27, he says, the, the summary of that is, the mis misery, <coughs> the real suffering of life is being away from God. Being away from God. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. And in 28, the next verse, he says, what is well-being? Well-being is to enjoy the presence of God. Enjoying the presence of God, that is the well-being. Now, we see here a movement of the psalmist's moods. The psalmist has a movement, experiences a movement from doubt to faith. He is slippery, but now he is standing firm. Like the book of, uh, sorry, in the Bible, in the New Testament, I counted, this word, stand firm, comes seven times in the New Testament. Seven times. Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. That is contra to being slippery. Faith and doubt and faith and doubt, is it real or not real? Am I in the right path or am I in the wrong path? Is this true or not true? You know, we swift between, swing between the doubt and faith like the ancient Israelites did. But we have to regain our balance. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, St. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, be watchful and stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be strong. And that phrase is repeated in the New Testament. I counted and I, uh, seven times, it could be more, but I mean, plus or minus one, but seven times, the Bible says, stand firm in spite of all that happens. Sickness, not being healthy, not being wealthy to your satisfaction. You know, that is what our problem is. We want to be wealthy to our satisfaction. In spite of all that, stand firm. And the psalmist has found that. Now, what does that, what does, what happened to the psalmist? What happened to the psalmist is simple. There is a turning point in his thinking. And that turning point happened when he went to the presence of God. Verses 16 to 17. But when I thought how to understand this, here is a mystery. Here is a problem. Here is an enigma. Why, how can people be, become rich and happy 
and healthy without God. And people like me are, have problems in life. Prayers are not answered. The way my sister is, the sister's children are doing very well. I am, my children are not. They seem to be very happy. They seem to go for exotic holidays. When I am not even able to go to the nearest mall, I can't afford it. So I try to understand this mystery. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to be a wearisome talk, task. No answers. People have told me, I went to the psychologist, I went to this guy and that guy and all this guy. I went to this prayer meeting, that prayer meeting, still the problem is not solved. True. I also have problems like that. Because I have sat hours and hours and hours, wrote the problem, priorities, things which are not prior, uh, things I might have done wrong. Oh, tons of paper was used, mind mapping to solve the problems, and I realized that it seemed to me a wearisome task. No answers. Thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. It was a wearisome task. Wearisome task means which makes you really weak, tired, end of the day. But Sami says, no, no, no. I was thinking about it. <laughs> I was thinking about this. How can this happen, God? How can this? And I was very brutish to God. I was angry with God, very bitter to God. And I even stopped going to church for a while because I thought there's no point going to the church again um, anymore. But the, he did one thing. He went to the sanctuary of God then I discerned their end. That is verse 17, probably. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, and then I discerned their end. That's what we call contemplation. How to find answers to life's questions for which there is no human answer? That's the point. How to find? There are lots of puzzles in life. Quite a lot of puzzles in life. Here is one puzzle. There could be many other puzzles that you are, enigmas that you are struggling with. What is the solution? The Sami says, thinking about it only creates more problems for me. Meditating on my problem, the world's problems, only creates more problems. But now I have found one alternative, and that is, go to the presence of God. Now, that is what we call contemplation. What is contemplation? The Latin original word, the original word in Latin, simply means gazing at. What is contemplating at God, on God? What is divine contemplation? Divine contemplation is Simply sitting in presence of God and gaze upon Him, look at Him, or just being aware of God's presence. The psalmist went to the sanctuary. I went to the sanctuary of God and I sat there and I said, Stop thinking now. But just think about God. When I became more and more aware of God and what God has in offer for me, then my problem. This doesn't be. Now, that is the solution to all the problems that we have in life. We have to contemplate. That means taking our eyes off our problems or the puzzles. This is not his problem. Actually, this is not his problem. He made this his problem. It was somebody else's problem. Why should I worry about my neighbor having a new car? No, recently I had this problem. It was not a problem for me. The car park adjacent to me was vacant when I occupied that flat. But last week, a new car has, I saw a car coming and there was sweets distributed. My neighbor has bought a new, brand new car and is parking it just opposite to me. My worry is, no. <laughs> See, I thought, why? <laughs> I mean, not in the sense, little uneasiness, 
But I am also very little anxious, worried about him, because he is parking his car close to a car which is already gathering rust. And I don't know whether that he is he's in a dangerous position. I'm sorry for him. Um, so anyway, what I'm saying is that many of the problems we have is the problems we create for ourselves. It's not our problem. When your, when your neighbor's child is, has an A+, plus, when your son has only an A, why should that be a problem? When your friend has a first class and you are struggling to make a mere pass, why that should be a problem? Have you ever thought about it? Yes, it becomes a problem because we, are, we have our eyes fixed on people instead of God. Now, but take the eyes off what you have created a problem for you and fix it on God, contemplate on God, then that changes the whole scenario. Fix it on God. Now, another person I can think of who did this is Prophet Habakkuk. If you know your Bible, you will see his book, a book written by Prophet Habakkuk. In just three chapters, you can read it on the way home. Now, Habakkuk had a problem. <laughs> Habakkuk's problem was he see a lot of violence in the country. There is a lot of corruption, there is a lot of killing, murders, and all bribery, and all sort of things are happening in the country. His own people. So he asked God, God, why is it happening? Why? Why your people are corrupt? Why they are violent? Why they are lying? Why they are doing this sort of thing and that sort of thing in chapter 1? Oh, yeah. So God said, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to deal with it. And so God said, no, 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 don't worry. I'm going to deal with it. So he asked men, a little bit of imagination here. He asked, how are you going to deal with it? So he said, look, I am going to send the Babylonian army against them and I will kill them. I will destroy their temple. I will destroy the city. That is another problem for Habakkuk. How, how can you use a Gentile people, nation, to punish your own people? What sort of a god are you? Now, so his problem doubles. He goes to God and says, God, stop this uh, among our, your people. Your people, Israel, is sinning. They are doing all sort of things, ungodly things. So please stop it. God said, yes, I will stop it. Because in a few years time, I am going to send the Babylonians against them. I will destroy everything. Kill them. Destroy them. Destroy their city. Destroy their temple. And they will not be a people anymore. Oh, is that the way you are going to do it? Then what type of God are you? So this is sometimes what happens. Another problem for you instead of solving your problem. Then, Habakkuk decided one thing. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, he said, now, that's enough. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me, that, and I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk rolled it in his head again and again, had many sleepless nights. But as a man of God, Habakkuk decided to go to God's presence, to listen to God, what God has to say. And he comes up with a new perspective, like the psalmist. And he wrote that beautiful poem that we read in Habakkuk 3. I will, see, there may not be cows, the animals in the, there will be no fruit on the fig tree, but yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. An amazing perspective. So, the first thing is to do is take your eyes off and fix it on God. What will that result in? When we take our eyes off, in the Psalmist's case, he found two things. That is, he discovered that God is good in spite of all the bad that happens to me. God is still good in spite of the bad things I have to face. 
in life. God is still righteous in spite of the unrighteousness that I have to face. His perspective on life changes. As I already said, he finds a new security and he finds a hope for the future. Now, that makes, transforms his feeling. He regains his happiness in life. He was bitter, but now he is hopeful. He was away from God or getting away from God, but now he says that being close to God is the best thing I can have. He is no more envious about anything in life. The whole thing has transformed. So what about the problem? What about the problem? Yeah. We know only one way to handle the problem, but has God has two ways of doing it. If you have some management training or if you have some training or some education or even without education also, you know, we want to solve our problems, isn't it? We want solutions to our problem. That's the only way we know. If there is a problem, we need to solve it. If I have a problem, I will sit with it late into the night to solve it in this, instead of, I mean, sort of saying a, a technical snack, a website problem or a computer problem, that sort of problems. I will sit to fix it. I will say I will sleep only after fixing it. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not successful. Everybody are obsessed with solving their problems and some people are sol trying to solve other people's problems as well. But God has another way. It is not solving, but it is dissolving the problem. Let me explain what I mean. When we focus our eyes on God, when we gaze upon Jesus and see the eternal realities begin to dawn on us, what God has in offer for us, we can, we don't have to solve every problem. The problem simply dissolves. So why should you solve a problem which has already dissolved? There are two ways, but we can only see one way. We want to solve our problems. But when a, a godly person have another perspective, when he gaze upon God and attuned to the words of God and is mesmerized by the wonders of God, the problems will simply dissolve. We don't have to find solutions for all the problems in life. The reality is, most of the problems in life which makes us unhappy are not our problems. We make many prob things our problems. And in Malayalam there is a saying, there is a story. There was a man who was having a very sumptuous lunch, very happy. His wife has cooked something where he has come back from a long journey and he's enjoying his lunch. Then when he was full, he just thought, he, I heard a, something is happening outside in the street. So he left his lunch there because he already had enough. So he said, did I hear uh, somebody calling me or something? You know, just a feeling, an inner feeling, a thought that came to me. So he left the lunch there, washed his hand, and went to the street, and he saw two people fighting or arguing or something like that. And he said, what's going on and all that. So they asked, who are you to get involved in our problem? And he pushed and pulled and pulled, and, and, there was a, and he got enough beating and came back to his lunch. So you actually want, this is, this is a proverb in Malayalam. Um, I don't know how to translate it very accurately. So you're eating a lunch. Why are you going out and making other people's <laughs> problem, your problem. Let them do well in life. <laughs> you are not a loser. Your problem, you don't have to solve your problems, brothers and sisters. If you gaze upon Jesus, if you look at that, 
And if you are filled with these wonders of what Jesus is, God is, the problem will simply dissolve. That is what happened to the psalmist. He went to his prayer room and he gazed upon God, he contemplated upon God, and then he realized that he can be happy without health and wealth. So, he moves from. See, what we need is strength in our struggles. We are people with a higher hope. Failure in this world doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because we have a life which is far beyond this earthly life. If you can, read Romans chapter 8, the whole of it. But let me read at least two verses. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 19. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not <coughs> worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed for, to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation, revealing of the sons of God. And in 36 and 39 of the same chapter, he says, because I have received a new insight, which only God can give. One thing I know, we are, verses 37 to 39, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. Do you need a faith that helps you through the harsh realities of life? That is, Sickness, poverty sometimes, lack, at least paucity. What all that goes through? What do we need? We need a faith that will take us across all these chasms, across all these valleys and over all the mountains on the way. And that is the happiness that Jesus offers. He will give us strength, sorry, struggles. And we'll have struggles. And we need struggles. One of the importance of having struggles in life is that we become stronger and stronger fighting our struggles. And then, one day, the struggles will go away. But the strength that we gathered by fighting the struggles, by faith in Jesus, will remain. Let me say that again. We will have struggles in life, problems in life, questions in life, but fighting all this by the grace of God and the power of God will gather a lot of strength. And then, one day when all these struggles are gone, will go, definitely go, they are not to stay, they will go. The end result is that we are strong. Strength that we gathered in adversities, Strength that we gathered, faith that is formed in times of trials, problems in the family, the faith, the strength that we gather by exercising our faith in God and the goodness of God, faith in the goodness of God, that faith and the strength that we gathered, that will stay, but struggles will go. That is the purpose, that is the beauty of suffering. I want to conclude with this beautiful hymn. Very well summarizes the sermon today. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That is the faith that Jesus offers.
turn your gaze from all that causes envy and jealousy, hatred and malice. Turn your eyes from there and look at Jesus. When everything will fall in its own place and it will gather the strength that it will stay and the struggles will go away. That is being happy the Jesus way. Will you all stand with me? As we sing that song as a confession of our faith, mm -hmm.